throughout the world, from Russia to India to Brazil to the United States. The idea of returning to ancient traditions forms a basic part of the global extreme right and fascist movement. Ben Teitelbaum has wrote, written a book about this very idea, traditionalism. We were fortunate to have a chance to interview Ben. Here is that interview. So we're talking here with Ben Teitelbaum. He's the author of this book, War for Eternity. And uh, he's written a lot on, um, on traditionalism, the theory of traditionalism. And Ben is by uh, academic background, he's a musicologist. So it's interesting um, just to think about how Ben went from the study of music to writing like fundamentally political material. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would explain it in two ways, John. I, I think that I would say, on, on the one hand, my interest in music is very much tied into music's social role. That's why I, I call myself an ethnomusicologist and a lot of my training is anthropology as opposed to music theory or something. Um, so, so really the move between music and politics is, is not quite as abrupt as it, might, as it might sound. So that's, what, that's one reason is that music actually introduced me to politics uh, and it, it also opened a lot of doors to people talking to me. It's much less threatening if you tell people you're a music scholar as opposed to a political scientist or an economist or, or you know, a criminologist or something like that. Uh, but the, the other reason is that I have multiple interests. I think, I think like most people, uh, I've, always, I've always been interested in politics. There's a brief period of time where I considered what direction I would choose within the university world. It became music, but a big part of me has always been has been always reading academic literature on politics um, and especially intellectual history. You know, before we get into traditionalism, one thing in reading your book, um, what brought to my mind was some of the writings of Gramsci on like kind of cultural hegemony and that sort of thing. I wonder if you would comment on that in relation to your interests and what you've been writing about. Sure, there, there are two ways in which Gramsci enters the, the picture of, 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 of my research. Uh, one of them is simply as a sort of theorist inspiring the work that I do, someone who I actually think that has, you know, who has accurate ideas about society. Um, and, and that's in the sense that, that Gramsci sees culture broadly conceived as being, as being a powerful driver of human society and at sometimes supplanting even economics, um, being more powerful. Um, and in that sense, for replacing the, the standard typical Marxist uh, diagram of, of social relations, which, which tends to place economics and material values as, at, at the center or at the base. Um, I think I think that Gramsci is right in doing that, and, and a lot of that that type of thinking undergrids research that I would be doing, in which I claim that music matters. Right when I say that you know that we we act politically, socially, economically, and our values, and those values come from things like music. Um, but the other way in which Gramsci matters is is more as a social truth, I'd say, rather than or in addition to being something that I think is actually true. Another way to put that is that the people I study follow Gramsci explicitly, a lot of them. Uh, and, and even those who don't do it explicitly seem to intuitively do that. There's a lot, a lot of, a lot has been written, for example, about Andrew Breitbart, uh, the namesake of Breitbart News, this far right online news magazine um, and, and media, uh, media outlet, who once said that, that politics are downstream from culture. Um, I don't know if he read Gramsci. I'm not. I'm not a, a real close follower of his. But of his, but that that basic idea has appealed to a lot of people. For someone like him, it might just have been uh, something that he arrived at more intuitively. But for others, Alain de Benoit, um, even Rush Limbaugh, believe it or not, uh, there's there's real consciousness 
of Gramsci. They use Gramsci to understand why in their mind it's impossible for a real robust um, anti-liberal, anti-modern right to germinate in the West because in their mind, you know, you can have a radical right, you can have even a radical left. They could probably apply the, the analysis to, to the radical left as well and say that, okay, they can, they might make a political party, maybe they'll win an election here and there, but the deep current of, of society is such that it forces them all into a particular mode, which is liberal, you know, modern liberalism, essentially. And there's, and there's no really way to get around that through politics. It comes from, and it shall be addressed through, and, and they, all these, these actors would hope to change it through the realm of, of culture. Um, so that's that's uh, that's where Gramsci figures into this. I'm trying to fit that into my own experiences, including trying to talk with workers who support Trump and uh, uh, those who have like conspiracy theories about COVID and and that sort of thing. And it seems to me they start out with kind of a general worldview that's in part based on fact and in part, but but then the, the, the it takes off from there and to the point that facts don't matter anymore. And so it's just kind of gut feelings that overwhelm the actual facts. And in mm -hmm. that sense, it seems to me it's related to culture. What What, yes. what would you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I think you're talking it's it, it's not many steps removed from the sorts of discussions that you would you would encounter in this in this kind of neo-Marxian territory where you know what I think when we talk today about identity being a, a primary driver, and there's a lot, there's a lot of conversations about that. I hope I hope this doesn't get derailed and, into one of the more um one of the more vivid, vivid tracks that, that we see in our discourse today, but when politics is 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 not about okay what policy would i like to see change what are my thoughts about this particular reform what are my thoughts about this particular idea of restructuring society or something but instead politics are about who am i right and does is is the person who's speaking speaking to me as 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 an identity um i think that 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 the process of getting there of getting to that place of identification reflects the power of culture uh it's it's the sort of thing where it, it used to be brought up especially from critics on the left who were saying okay look at look at the people who would benefit from um from a more egalitarian economic order are oftentimes the same people who are being hurt, um, let's say the rural Midwest or rural post-industrial parts of the United States, or people who would benefit from more stringent environmental protections. You know, the, the, who, who's in the actual crosshairs of, of pollution? Um, it should be these people, but they're not voting that way. And, and, and what has taken over is a, is, a, is a sort of cultural identification. People don't vote for a particular policy, not because they think it's bad policy, but because it's not who they are. And when you talk about the intuitive, the unspoken nature of this, too, that also relates to this taken for grantedness of uh, or, or commonsensical understanding of of the world that that are also harm, hallmarks of hegemony, hallmarks of this uh, the most powerful type of idea, uh, when you, an, an idea that does not need to be justified, is so so deep seated in your society that it is not not justified, sometimes not named certainly not enforced with coercion and it's you know if, if if you have an ambition if you yourself are wanting to read into that or you have an ambitious reader connecting Gramsci with Hannah Arendt's um, writings on violence is actually quite interesting in this respect because she she views violence and power as being opposites and and hegemony definitely is is, is a sort of synonym for power in the sense that it it's an idea, a force that exists and grips people completely void of coercion. That's that's power. Or, or, or to put it another way, talking with some of these people, what always comes to my mind is 
cutting off your nose to spite your face. Mm -hmm. You don't really care if it hurts you. All you care about is you want to hurt those people. <laughs> it could be a game of, of you know, this, the, the identity, this is who I am and I'm not them. Right, right. right. So, and if they're upset, it's a politics of form rather than content is, is another way to say it. So with that as a long way around it, uh, around an introduction, would you explain what traditionalism is and how it developed and what it is? It's a very hard question, John. <laughs> yeah, we got another uh, hour to go just with that. I know, right? Um, you could call it you could call it a religious school uh, or a philosophy. That's what it was first. Uh, a teaching. Um, it emerged out of Orientalist um, lay scholars of comparative religion in uh, early 1900s Europe, late 1800s. And um, it was premised on the idea that that it, this relates to the concept of perennialism, if, if there's anyone listening knows what that is, but this idea that ages, ages ago, uh, there was an actual true, authentic, accurate religion that got it right. And over time, uh, its truths were scattered and dispersed and lost. Uh, and it exists, its, its truths uh, only, only um, sprinkle our world today in, in imperfect form, um, disconnected from one another in the hands of a few religions that are practiced today. Um, and the goal of the traditionalist is, is essentially to understand what that, that whole was. Um, but the way that they they try to do that is often through devoting themselves exclusively to one one particular path. Uh, the religions are Hinduism first and foremost, um, but also Sufism, sometimes esoteric Catholicism, sometimes Kabbalah. But it's the mystic branches of of these of these world religions, these so-called great religions. Uh, Buddhism can sometimes sometimes play a role there, and. Uh, I, I could talk a lot about that, about why those things, those religions are the way they are, but the, the important thing for politics and what came, came to be important for the people I studied uh, were, were a couple of ideas, a couple of features of that old religion that they think was true and which was scattered and which they want to recreate. One of the features which explains why the old tradition was lost is a belief in cyclicality, in, in cyclic time. So a belief that Every moment that passes, um, uh, we are actually, we're never really leaving our past behind us. We're in a process of kind of moving away from our past, but also coming back to it. They believe that we cycle through four, four eras, a golden to a silver, to a bronze, to a dark era. And um, as, as that right there explains, they typically think that this cycle goes from good to bad until a cataclysmic reset occurs and then you're back in a good and, you, and you're cycling back to bad and back to good um, on and on and on never really going anywhere but also as things get bad you're also closer to a reset um, to a cataclysmic explosion when things restart in a golden era so um, uh, opposite that they also think what see in their tradition an explanation of what is good and what is bad um, and that one way to understand that is the way that they see hierarchy as being called to attention by that old tradition. Uh, they think that in a virtuous society, you have essentially the Hindu caste system. What I think in most, most people's understandings is the Hindu caste system, um, where society should be strictly organized. There should be borders. Borders should be allowed to exist between different people. And at the top of the hierarchy should be those who value immaterial uh, things. Priests, um, they should be few in number, fewer than the masses at the bottom who are slaves and value material things. The body above them, we would have merchants valuing goods. Um, above them, you would have warriors who value more, more worldly immaterial, immateriality like, uh, like honor, things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, finally priests on top. All that is a way to say the traditionalists to put a quick bow on this, John, is to say that they see, they see a time cycle going on. They think that in order to get to a golden age, you have to move through darkness and move through destruction. And that what, what is bad about the dark age 
Is, um, is materialism a focus on either bodies or goods? Is massification and quantification uh, a belief that, uh, that it's really wrong and bad to be, um, let's say, organizing society based on, based on um, majorities or what's, what's good for the most, most of us? Um, and, and that a better world can come into existence if borders are established, if we if we don't if we're not borderless, and and theology, spirituality, hierarchy, elitism, are able to come back into existence, um, that's that's the basics of traditionalism carried into politics. Of course, I could go on, but I'll we'll leave it there. You know, while I was reading your book, I was talking about it with my wife, and I was trying to explain what traditionalism was. And she just got very impatient and said, you know what, that's just a lot of bullshit. <laughs> and so why are there ideas like the ideology? Why is it not just a lot of abstract philosophizing that has nothing to do with the real world? I, d I don't know. I, I'm, I, you know I'm, I've never really set myself to that particular task of saying this is why you know, this, this is a good philosophy or it's at least, at least good enough. Um, not, you know, what not whether it's is... good or not, not whether you agree with it or not, but, you know, you can sit in a room and contemplate your navel for several years and come up with all kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. So why is it, why is it not something like that? There, there are a couple of ways to, th to look at that particular question one is to say I, I think one is to pay attention to what it does for people and and the things that it might do that navel gazing would not um one thing that it does is it tells the nostalgic and nostalgia is a powerful force in politics right now but it tells the nostalgic that you don't have to be a nostalgic in fact, that the past, that you, the golden era that has passed, that you think has gone to you, can actually be had again, right? And there, there's an odd resonance between that idea and the forward slogan that was part of the campaign that Steve Bannon worked for, namely, make America great again, a belief that some goldenness or greatness of the past can be once again had. Um, so that's, that's, that's one aspect of this is, is I think that that deep nostalgia of our society um, is reframed in traditionalism as, as you know, where the past is not past to, to paraphrase one of the figures from my book. The other thing is that it brings together a lot of grievances that tend to populate the ideological world of the radical right. Um, borderlessness, in terms of nation states, in terms of the boundary between men and women, between ethnicities, um, they're all folded together. Traditionalism tells, tells us that they're all essentially the same phenomenon. Elitism, um, a, a sort of disregard for the good, uh, a, a common good or an, an anti-egalitarianism, um, and also, uh, a, a disregard to politics being focused on economics. Now that does bring traditionalists into conflict with, with neoliberals, let's say, um, and capitalists. Uh, but it, it essentially folds capitalists, neoliberal capitalists and Marxists together in the same, in the same cauldron and says that th their, their differing opinions about the distribution of wealth and equity in, in, in wealth are really just surface uh, surface debates that are betraying a deeper unity, which is that both of those forces think that think that material goods are what matter most in the world. With traditionalism, you do get you get a narrative as strange and as quirky as it is, and the strangeness can be can be appealing too, or it can be it can be a, a real turnoff. But at least it gives a narrative that folds together all of those things and. And for a certain brand of the right, that's that that's a lot of their ideological universe. You know, like what when I think about, you know, like you talk about those ancient religions, and my view, you know, all philosophies 
you, you, they, they, they are related to the class nature of the society that they come from. And really what you're talking about is ideas that spring from feudalism and the feudal ruling classes. So that, that's the significance of, of, I mean, so in a way they're trying to return to, or would you agree with this, that in a way they're trying to return to ancient societies that are never coming back. Which is you could say that. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you were to ask them, they would say, I think that they would say kind of. Um, Alexander Dugan, who's one of the figures who's at the center of my book, he, he doesn't write that much about returning to, to feudal medieval Europe or something like that. But instead, it, it so is... It's still values. It's still values. It's, it's more, though, uh, it's more Iran. It's more contemporary Iran. Um, you know, an aristocratic military order um, and one where where economics, you know, where the people on the top were also the, the most wealthy. I, I don't think that that would be pitched in ways that appear to these appeal to these people primarily. It's rather that you have a, this, a sort of feudalism, but that is fixed so that it doesn't relate to worldly honor or to money, but instead relates to spiritual spiritual power. Um, now, that doesn't mean that that's, that's an explanation to justify the economics of that, but, but I think I, we would want to be sensitive so that we know what we're talking about. That's certainly not how they would frame it. They would want to see the hierarchy organized around, around religion. So, but of course, in reality, those religions spring from feudal societies, or in some cases, slave societies. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in one, um, your book, this is, uh, you, you say that, um, that from their, their view, and I think you were referring to Bannon in particular, uh, Steve Bannon, say they see globalism, quote, they see globalism as, quote, a threat to the sovereignty of average people everywhere. And what I'm curious, how would Bannon reply to this? Look, globalism is, if you want to talk about in, globalism in the sense of international capital, international in, uh, markets, international production of goods, that's here and it's never, it's not going away. And so it, the only question is, whether the capitalist class controls it or the working class. Mm -hmm. But what you're trying to, not you, Bannon, what Bannon is trying to return to is a period that's gone and never coming back. So how would he respond to that? I, th I, th I think we would encounter in that question and, and his likely response, why traditionalism appeals to him. Um, because he would say no. I, he would say that globalism, and in fact, we've, we had this conversation a couple of times. I mean, he, he thinks that globalism is absolutely um, in the process of dying. Um, and, you know, the explanations for that could be the rise of China, it could be Russia, it could be the disintegration of the European Union, it could be the weakening of the United Nations, it could be um you know attendant to china's rise the weakening reach of the united states the new the newfound um revulsion for for u.s foreign intervention um it, for him those i think those would be would be signs that no something is actually changing and that the you know i think that's what he would meet you with first john he would say all those things but at at, at a deeper level he would say also don't don't buy into a progressive myth that you know that's things have changed and they can never go back um because that you know i think you would call that a modern a modernist misunderstanding that history might not perfectly repeat itself but it will almost um and we are going to find ourselves uh in a place where we view globalization and these mass attempts at global integration as being 
um, foolhardy attempts to, to do something in kind of a parenthetical experiment in, in a grander human history that, that is bound to something else. Do you, does that, I mean, I, I think, um, so I think he would come up with specific examples to push back on, but then there would also be this, there would, there would be a deeper metaphysical um, point he would try to make there as well. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I mean, the countervailing argument as well, the same thing can be said about nationalism. That we went from localism to regionalism in terms of production, culture, and, and everything else, from local production and distribution to regional mm -hmm. to national. And now what you're seeing is actually the nation states breaking down. Like mm -hmm. in the United States, people are talking about secession. And I mean, people are talking about civil war, literally. Right. So, yeah, right. it might be breaking down, but it's breaking down into what? Chaos and, and, and destruction. I guess right. they would, at least uh, Dugan would welcome that. That's like the final battle that'll lead us back to the golden age. As part of, if you think to the pyramid, the, the hierarchy I was talking about, and, and kind of the, the two alternatives that you have there, an intact hierarchy with all these borders versus, you know, just a mass, undifferentiated. Um, for, for them, I think that that resonates with a, a view that, that, you know, taking the large structure and breaking it down into small pieces is a good thing. It's a more natural and it's a, it's a, it, it, and it hopefully in their minds, it will also lead in a more spiritual direction. The connections between that have never been especially clear to me. I, I should say it's more of a co-occurrence in their mind that, you know, breakdown borders will equal spirituality. Um, but, but yeah, you, you're, you're certainly right about that. Um, I think a lot of, oddly, a lot of the calls for sovereignty um, and, and also for feeling a sense of control, whether it is economics, whether it's politics, I think even on the left with, with environmentalism in a certain sense, you know, the belief that, well, can we, can I myself, can my contribution do anything about these large, these larger issues? And the answer is kind of no, but you, you do have domain over some, some territory and some arena. And, and in order to realize that domain, you need to turn local, right? Um, doing anything else is waste, is a waste, a wasted effort. Yeah. So there, and, and that's, and, it, and that's, that's subnational. Absolutely. You know, the other part of this question is, I would guess, like, for instance, in the United States, that 99% of people that follow Trump, that, that, you know, maybe support Bannon in some way or another, have never heard of traditionalism. Mm -hmm. Are totally unfamiliar with the theories that, you know, that, that you describe. So how important are those theories, that ideology, in terms of actual developments, political developments in the United States? Why does it matter? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. It, it's they certainly don't, it's not only that they don't know about it, they'd surely be alienated by it. They wouldn't want anything to do with it. It's, it would seem weird and, and foreign to them, foreign to their identities, what we were talking about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, so what the, the question, if I were to rephrase it, what is the causal, uh, impact of traditionalism in, in populism today? It's not a question that I, I actually offer, uh, a firm answer to in my book. Uh, I, I really don't know. It's more speculative for me. What we have seen is that some of the most diehard ideologues of populism, not the voters, on the one hand, and not the not the politician speaking to the voters, but the ideologue who's kind of working behind the politician, who's trying to organize, who's trying to make sense, in some cases, who's trying to narrativize this historical moment. Those are the figures who have either been inspired by traditionalism or found traditionalism to be a useful language for them to make sense of things to themselves in most cases and to other people who are like them, but not to the masses. So what is that? What is 
what does that mean in terms of what traditionalism is doing? It could be egging on the more ideologically radical and ideologically devout figures of this of this world and of this moment. That's one thing. Um, another way to look at it is less is less a commentary on traditionalism and more a commentary on populism. Uh, you could say, okay, traditionalism has produced some really radical thinkers who who look at politics and society in ways that are quite quite a bit different from, let's say, the standard GOP Republicans. Um, they're they're really out there, um, but populism is such a vague program. It's such an open, non-committed uh, political ideology that it makes space for these figures too. Um, so, so those are those are really the the two ways that I think about it. That that traditionalism kind of uh, you know can perhaps inspire greater radicalism among in in more um, a, a more kind of uh, unbridled commitment from from these ideologues. But the other thing is to don't ask the question about traditionalism. Ask the question about what it tells us about populism. So, you know, in your book you in a couple of places describe when uh, Bannon tries to explain his views as far as traditionalism, how he just gets completely mixed up and hems and haws around and, and can't even put a coherent sentence together. Yes. And why, why would you not, uh, or for myself, as a socialist and political activist, or for any serious worker, why would we not just say, look, as my wife said, this is all just a bunch of bullshit. What he's really after is to divide and confuse the working class to, and in order to further empower a small section of the capitalist class to run right over society and do whatever the hell they want, pollute, plunder, and to their heart's content. Well, one reason is I'm not sure that's true. Um, that's 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 the main one. And and I sh I should I should divulge a bias. I I'm I'm always skeptical. I have to be skeptical as an intellectual, but it's also I think my my honest feeling. I do have a a little uh, um, kind of gut reaction against someone saying, oh, this person is just this, right? I see this veil of complexity, but underneath the veil is actually a brutal simplicity. The reason I'm, I'm suspicious against it is not so much that that could never occur in that person. It's just that the move itself saying that about someone is just too beautifying of myself, too um, rationalizing of disengagement and, and a lack of curiosity and a lack of analysis, it it justifies a sort of intellectual laziness that is always that is always going to um, is always going to be attractive <laughs> because we don't want to do work um, uh, we don't want to do that that work of, of of considering the possibility that someone someone is 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 doing something genuinely new and uh, or if not genuinely new at least at least that deserves serious analysis right um and in and in bannon's so what so that's one reason why I, I i don't go down that path as an analyst what do we get from from looking more closely at him i don't i'm not sure really um it's you know in, in following different reactions to my book there are those who say okay this this guy is an actual ideologue and I like it. There are those who say this guy's a real ideologue, and wow, look at how terrifying this is. And 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 this is different. This is not Mitch McConnell. This is not, you know, Newt Gingrich. This is something entirely different. We need to be ready for it. And there are also others who say, um, who say, no, I don't think. I think this is a blowhard. I don't think he knows what he's doing. I think he likes the idea of himself being a, a, a fancy. Uh, a fancy intellectual and, and thinker, and he's come up with, with this language for doing that, for mystifying himself, but he doesn't know what he's doing. He really is just out after enriching himself. And I can I can see evidence for all three positions. I, I, I really can't. Or, well, not I, I shouldn't say for the first one, 
this guy is strange and I like him. That one I don't. I, I see the... I see evidence for the two positions of him being having in some sense developed a coherent and, and semi-original way of thinking. Um, original in the sense at least that it diverges from the mainstream. And I can see this someone saying, um, th this is all a game. He's actually doing something tremendously familiar, not radical, but in fact, just, just very, very typical of, of the American right. One example of the latter, if, if I can riff on this for a moment, John, is and I and I wrote this about him. Um, it was a Wall Street Journal op-ed of all places. Um, after the uh, after the fraud indictment that he had for the border wall in uh, Texas, New Mexico, along the Mexican border, uh, you know what we saw was very clearly a project that was meant to oppose some sort of globalization, right? Building a border wall. We're going to finance it privately. Why does one want to build a border wall? Bannon will give you a lot of explanations that do not that have to do with workers' rights. Uh, and he's very good at, at at very articulate at offering those those examples that really migration and the flow of goods and people is bad for workers in the United States. What did he do with the initiative? What actually was the outcome of it? He enriched himself with a lot of money. Right. Built a mile of border wall that does nothing. Did not help anything and, and enriched himself and his friends with a lot of money. That speaks to uh, that speaks to uh, something that is that is plainly familiar. The other stuff that would speak against it, um, I do think that he is genuinely interested in tearing up establishments in this country, institutional establishments. Um, you know whether or not he enriches himself and his particular friends is 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 another question but he does not seem to want fox news to survive does not want the republican party to survive necessarily uh isn't that interested in the power of the u.s federal government but it all, all but his his interest in destruction goes far beyond the typical libertarian uh frame um and his romanticism of the white working class while creepy um, and and with more than one racist kind of race ideological undertone to it or overtone, um, still strikes me as different from Mitt Romney. It's the sort of thing I can never ever imagine Mitt Romney saying. Oh yeah. Um, so so that's sorry I'm talking a lot here, but it's, it's a serious question that, that it deserves a long response. But but that's um gives you gives you a little bit of the lay of the land as to why i answer it with ambiguity i mean th there's no doubt that he's different from mitt romney and and really even a lot of the republicans in his camp i'm not talking about the mainstream Repu or the former mainstream Re republicans but you say well he's developed a coherent theory but in your book you describe how he's absolutely incoherent when he tries to explain, you know, he can't put a full sentence together even. Yeah, and and what do we, the question is, what do we make of that? Um, it's, could be that he's making it up, but it's also what he's trying to describe is very, very difficult to talk about. Um, it'd be difficult for, if, if, if we were to try and discuss, you know, the mysteries of the universe in these terms and discuss comparative religion I, and, and, and metaphysics, that's a difficult conversation for anyone to have. Um, his sloppiness, I, <laughs> you know, that he's, he's not a professional philosopher. <clears throat> he doesn't write. Um, this this exists. He, he reads a lot, but he doesn't write that much he wrote some some kind of crappy articles for for breitbart he's more though of a, of a conversationalist that's that's the area of his production it's it's not a place that is going to demand that he be as disciplined as he is i'm making excuses for him here um but i'm I, i'm not sure i think it's the wrong conclusion simply to say that because he's inarticulate and he really is on these matters in, in particular that it means that there's not an actual that there's not coherence there, because um, I do suggest in the book at the same time as there's linguistic semantic incoherence, 
I do think across the number of interviews that I had with him, there were consistent ideas. Um, there were consistent values. There was a consistent agenda as well into, into how he relates to those ideas. That's the coherency opposite opposite the, the other incoherence. You know, I mean, my view is that ideas do matter. Mm -hmm. like if ideas if or if they don't have practical conclusions then they're just sophistry mm -hmm. and in his case you know or or to put it another way the way to understand the ideas is to see what practical conclusions they they lead to and so that's the mm -hmm. way that we can understand bannon's ideas mm -hmm. i have one i agree with you absolutely with one one little asterisk and in that i don't believe in logical conclusions of ideas um that's a phrase that's used used a lot um the the problem the way that anthropology sociology crashes into the world of of intellectual history political theory philosophy is hypocrisy of course um it's people who say that they are one thing or will do one thing and then act in an entirely different way and and that's it it's not a limited phenomena and it it means to me that 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 you know we you can't just say okay here's the idea and this is what the idea will do right mm -hmm. right there's not a simple so. direct clear line from an idea to an action and no. or or to put it a different way everybody ourselves included hold contradictory ideas in our in our minds and which ideas tend to dominate at one particular time can change yes and yes so it, it, it's not it's not you know like logic is two plus two equals four but the world doesn't work that simply no, I mean, because two plus two equals four in the abstract, first and foremost. Right, right. But sometimes four is greater than two plus two. Mm -hmm. but any, so to get back to, this is kind of an aside, but I don't know, are you familiar with Matt Heimbach? Name sounds awfully familiar. So, so he had formed, and at the time, this was a couple of years ago, he had formed a group. He's he's one of the kind of the oh you're the, the West, traditional West fascist traditionalist yes. workers party. And traditionalist time, workers party. This was when I read about it. This was a couple of years ago. I didn't think very much of it, you know that term. But yep. I'm I'm now starting to see. So this is where kind of traditionalism has found its way into. He's since I think he went to prison for some kind of sexual misconduct and, and the party collapsed. He's now back out again, participating in the quote, anti-war movement, to, you know. Um, but anyway, this is where, this is where kind of traditionalism found its way into practical everyday politics. An, an attempt, to, and it's very interesting because this party, I remember when that came out, taking a look at it, passing you know references of it to a few colleagues and talking about it and everyone no one was really convinced that this guy had actually read much traditionalism it's very hard to read it, it doesn't appeal to the average person but it had provided a sort of symbolic banner for him and there were small phrases on the website that suggested i, I really should have tried to interview him really if i wanted to, to investigate it seriously but they were just small phrases, little catchphrases, memes, you know, banner slogans that that seemed to suggest that he had at least watched a YouTube video of someone talking about traditionalism or so, you know, something in that in that vein. Um, and and yet it collapsed, you know, part of the another part of the story and one reason why, uh, you know, I, I, I want to make sure people reading my book, don't think that I'm saying traditionalism is the new thing that's going to take over populism. It's, I, I, that's not settled, but one, 
one thing you see is that everyone who has tried to bring these ideas into politics usually ends up self-destructing in some way. Um, and it could be because there's something in these ideas. I think rather it tends, it, it's, it's a co-occurrence here that the, the ideas tend to appeal to very, very reckless, overly idealistic people who are not gonna be resigned to the type of coalition building and socialization that is necessary for, um, at least for party politics um, these days. So uh, yeah, in, in, that, in that case, this traditionalist workers party is, is very much in line with, with, with trends. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he incidentally. I'll probably just have time. I'm so sorry, John. I'll probably just have time for one one more question here. Okay. Yeah. Well, just in conclusion, um, how do you see? I mean, it seems like you're saying that traditionalism is not about to take over U.S. politics, but it does represent um, kind of a how can I put it? It gives a clear picture of a of a more general trend in U.S. politics, and not just the U.S. So, my view as a socialist is the answer is socialist movement. But how how would you see the alternative to this general trend in American and really in global politics? Oh my gosh, that's a difficult. I I don't know. Would you rather do a, a second interview around that? <laughs> I, I won't. I don't. I won't have an answer to that. I mean, to me, to me, if you're trying to think about okay, what does this mean for the future? Um, I think that we have a level of discontent with certain modernist values that that is deep and, and restless and is finding various expressions. Traditionalism is one of them. I think it could as well express itself in a different way. You have populism that again is, is noteworthy because of what it is not, because of its absences. And it's its absences, it's the, 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 um, the hollowness of a lot of populist uh, visions and explanations for society are what allows such a diversity of, of ideas to germinate in its midst. Um, my, so I'm, I'm not a socialist. I'm, I'm one of these uh, probably much reviled centrist left-wing people in your circles. I'm sorry, John. Um, my, my instinct is to look in a different direction. I, I am very concerned about um, the loss of community, um, the loss of meaningfulness, uh, and the loss of sovereignty that, that I think is being played upon here and that is being instrumentalized in different ways. Um, if, if socialism can address those issues very well, then I'm in favor, then I, then I like socialism in that respect. Um, but something, something needs to happen. It needs to be taken seriously. It, those drives cannot be left to the to the to the voices of racism, of exclusion. They cannot be left to uh, these hyper reactionary um, causes because they will they will use them. They will use them to great effect. So I, I would much rather see the opponents of uh, of the populist right hone in on those on those questions, meaningfulness control community. We've known the whole time theorists of modernity, theorists of liberalism um, have have always been aware of the fact that these these changes were going to harm our, our ability to place ourselves in the world and find a role for ourselves uh, in society. And we've just kind of nodded at that at that observation and plowed forward. So something something to address it. So since we have to leave it there, I'll just leave it since this is for my blog site, with this comment or this riff on what you're saying is the alternative sense of community is class, to see ourselves as a world working class. And that's the community, that's the alternative to kind of identity politics, both of the quote left and the right. Mm -hmm. If that will do it. Yeah, you know, if that will actually give if that will give the sense of community and, and meaning. I That's my concern. Yeah, I can't see any alternative to if you start looking at community in terms of geography or identity, 
you know, in terms of you're this or that or the other ethnic or religious group or, or, or gender or whatever, it inevitably opens itself up. Mm -hmm. All the kinds of things that we're grappling with and, and, and trying to counter. Mm -hmm. but, and as I said, the alternative is to see yourself as part of the world working class. That's why we support the working class in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and or mm -hmm. or Syria for that matter mm -hmm. or, yeah or or Tennessee so mm -hmm. anyway thanks mm -hmm. very much for your time Ben um if you John, have these, yeah these were you know I you know I do a lot of interviews uh thanks for some real hardball questions and to your wife <laughs> <laughs> you, you you'd be surprised you'd be surprised how seldom it is that someone actually it puts puts those types of questions so thank you okay well uh, um i hope that we have a chance to continue this in the future and when if you ever come out to oakland i hope we can meet in person i would love that i would love that we'll see if berkeley ever ever invites me back <laughs> there you go all right thanks very much for your time yes you too you okay. too take care bye now